Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 180 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be doing another roundtable episode. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to thank everyone for their support this season. We've had some great interviews with some fantastic guests and covered some wide-ranging topics in the world of renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. A quick shout out to the patrons who support the podcast through regular monthly donations. An end of season review episode is coming your way soon. Thanks also to ZapMap for their continued sponsorship of the show. Finally, a quick appeal. You've probably listened through to all the episodes this season. Perhaps you've enjoyed a few of them, maybe more than a few. You might have learned something, discovered something, or had some piece of information confirmed or denied in your head as a result. Well, I hope so. If you did, have you considered maybe supporting the podcast financially? You can become a patron and get special offers, extended episodes, and patron-only shows. Or you can set up a regular donation on the coffee.com account, ko-fi.com. It all helps me to pay for hosting fees, editing, and bandwidth costs, and for my producer, who's doing a great job making it all sound really great. Just a side note before we start with the actual roundtable itself, in the discussion that follows, you'll notice that Warren Phillips' audio quality isn't fantastic. Uh, Bear that in mind when you wonder why his contribution to the earlier part of the podcast is minimal. Today, we're holding the roundtable for season nine. Links to the previous few roundtables are in the show notes. And if you've listened to those episodes, you'll know that we have a number of specially invited guests who come on and lead the discussion on various topics of interest in the EV or renewable space. So let me start by introducing the members of this season's EV Musings roundtable. First, we have Kate Tyrrell. Kate is the founder and CEO of ChargeSafe and friend of the podcast, as this is her third appearance on the show. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Gary. I'm very excited to be here. We're very excited to have you. Thank you. Uh, Then we have Tor Horitsoy, the CEO and founder of Spiri. Tor was on the show earlier this season discussing Norway's EV transition and the lessons we can learn in the UK from that transition. Welcome, Tor. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward. It should be a good discussion. Finally, we have Warren Phillips. Warren's the chairman of the EVA England and lobbies on behalf of EV drivers at parliamentary level, amongst other things. Welcome, Warren. Afternoon, Gary. How are you? I'm very well. Glad to have you on board. The format is quite simple. Each guest has a topic they'd like to present to the group. They frame the topic, open it to um, to the group to discuss. And once we've put the world to rights, we move on to the next topic. In previous roundtables, we've discussed home charging, Tesla opening their supercharger network to the rest of the world, throttling rapid charges at peak times, second-hand EVs and similar topics. And links to those earlier shows are in the notes. So on the agenda this week are the following items the future of network consolidation and what changes we can expect over the next five years. Uh, How do we bring charging to the masses? And finally, why can't we pay for all charging with one card or app? So first, I'd like to hand over to Kate. What are you discussing, Kate? So my interesting topic today is to look at the future of consolidation what changes we can expect over the next five years and how we support a smooth customer journey through the transition. Okay, off you go. So (laughs) once upon a time, uh, back in the early noughties when um, nobody really had a a, a sufficient mobile device and they were just these big clunky brick type things, you may remember networks uh, such as BT, uh, we had BT Cellnet, we had T-Mobile, we had Orange, uh, we had Talk Talk. Um, Am I throwing you back now? (laughs) Oh, it's all bringing you back memories, definitely. Econet, yeah. So we had all of these uh, companies that kind of, you know, really leapt on this fun and exciting uh, new technology. And then Within the space of really a decade or two at a push, most of them had ceased operations. They had sold out to bigger partners or they were completely dissolved. So 
we have, what is essentially left is um, two of the largest networks, T-Mobile and Orange, joined forces to create what we now know as EE. We have three. We have Vodafone and we have O2. So we have four massive operators. And the reason why I name those and not others that you may be aware of is because they already own the other smaller brands, um, umbrella brands beneath those platforms, which you may not be aware of. So for the likes of uh, BT Mobile owned by EE, Asda Mobile owned by Vodafone, 1P Mobile owned by EE, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, Tesco owned by O2, et etc. et cetera. So my thought process behind this is that we're going to see those smaller, um, ambitious drivers of networks um, potentially fail um, at, at relatively reasonable hurdles. You know, there's a lot of competition in the market. It's a very expensive process to deliver electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of land being bought up or, or leased out, and those contracts will cease uh, to to um, you know, they're going to run out at some point and other people will come in and, and maybe be able to pay a little bit more money. So right now, as it stands, according to ZapMap, we have 106 networks across the UK. So it's a really, really similar situation to the mobile phone networks. I think we're going to end up with a big six and a lot of these companies are going to end up selling off their assets. And we're going to see lots of mergers and acquisitions over the next five to 10 years. What do you think? Tor, what do you reckon? I share the same view for the future as you do, uh, for certain. Uh, I think it's a good thing in the beginning that you have a lot of sort of uh, players in the market who sort of try to bring these services to all the EV drivers out there, sort of to bring the solution. So that's a natural sort of phase that we are Entering, as you described it, it's what many of the industries have gone through. But I'm mm -hmm. very certain that you will see a big, we will see a big consolidation in the future uh, because that's needed. Uh, it's going to be a huge infrastructure we are building, not only in the UK, but across Europe and across the world. And for that to be sort of have the better user experience for that, to have sort of the lower pricing, you need bigger entities. Uh, also to have that integration in in the user experience of driving between networks. So everything points in the direction, I think, uh, on consolidation. And I will say that in some of the earlier markets, we are already seeing that now, that yeah. actually in the, in, in the second phase of this rollout, that consolidation is both uh, sort of natural, but also needed to sort of bring charging to a big scale industry, which it will be like telco, as you mentioned, but also like any other infrastructure investments that uh, have been rolled out uh, globally until now. So I share the, your viewpoints, but of course, there's pitfalls on going there. Uh, and uh, who will win the market or who will serve the market in the future is still uh, to be shown, I think. Well, I think this is exactly it. So we've seen BP Pulse, you know, re-emerge as BP Pulse before, you know, there were um, a different brand. They've come in and they've acquired several uh, smaller networks. So you've got the likes of Charger Car and Polar um, that have been acquired onto that network. Some of it still remains um, with the previous branding on. Shell have come in, you know, they've purchased Ubitricity um, and, and some other smaller networks. And the danger in that, so it's great that they're coming in and they're giving this funding uh, to infrastructure that's so desperately needed. When we drive around the UK um, as charge safe inspectors, there are so many orphan sites that have previous branding on them that appear to be disconnected, missing plugs and cables, et cetera, but are still showing as active on mapping applications. What is, what is the concern here moving forward? How do we make sure that the charges are updated um, via an OCPI so that we know that it's an orphan site and it's currently redundant. Or how do we apply pressure to these larger network providers who are coming in and purchasing these assets and then not doing anything with them? And by the way, this is happening with more than just BP and Shell, but they are the two most obvious examples of, um, of, of abandoning uh, sites that I can think of right now. Well, I, w I was just—I'm going to use my uh, the phrase that that 
Kate knows I'm going to say now, which is, Kate? He's going to play devil's advocate. That's Let talk. me play devil's advocate, <laughs> indeed. Um, one of the, whilst I agree that the consolidation is probably the way to go, and historically we, we know that, as you said, with like the telecom, telecom um, companies, that's how it works. But the downside to this is as you reduce the amount of choice for the customers, you then increase the power of the charge point operators to mandate whatever prices they want. So at what point do we hit that sort of tipping point where we say, right, we now have a small enough number of charge point operators to make sure that we're avoiding the issues that you've talked about, uh, Kate, with orphan sites and orphan um, equipment. But we've now moved into that point where they're just, to quote a phrase, too big to fail, and therefore they're they're dictating the the pricing strategy, and we're almost into a monopoly situation where it's not actually that good for the end consumer. What do we think? I think that um, anybody new to driving an EV or or those who are you know understandably a little bit skeptical about trans- transitioning to an electric lifestyle could potentially see these orphan sites and. That is their their one interaction with EVs, and just see it and think, God, if that's you know what the infrastructure looks like, you can count me out. That that is a huge issue that we're looking at. Not only that, but we've got um, there's there's something of a handover gap that's happening with some of these networks. So there's an on street charging point quite nearby where I live, and I went to use it um, a couple of months ago on the Friday, of fully charged south. I wanted to plug it into charge overnight so that I could return uh, to Farnborough the following morning and the charger failed to uh, initiate the, the connection. So I went on to a second and a third from the same operator all within a 10, 15 minute walk of my home. And each time the charger would not con- communicate with the car. So I called the customer service line that was on the charge point and on the application um, only to be informed that They didn't take calls for that operator anymore, which doesn't mean anything to me as the end user because I just want my car to work. I want the charger to work so that I can get up early in the morning and carry on with my day. And I insisted that I was given a a telephone number for someone that I could speak to because electric vehicle chargers are a lifeline for some who do not have the luxury of being able to charge from home. Now, when I called this second number, I was greeted with the warm affections of a monotone robot telling me that the office hours were Monday to Friday, nine to five. And I just burst into tears and I thought, this is ridiculous. Like, how how can we support those drivers if the handover between businesses isn't seamless? And, And what standards are there out there that can help us with this transition. At the moment, there's no regulation, there's no standards, there's no protocol, there's no no, no best in show practice of how we navigate these new waters. Um, how do we ensure that these, these drivers aren't being left behind and that some brands aren't giving the entire industry a really bad name? Uh, Tor, let me just ask you a, a sort of question that links into that, which is obviously your Scandinavian base there, particularly places like Norway, are far ahead of the UK in terms of the EV um, infrastructure and, and the the ecosystems, with the consolidation that's taken place with some of the charge point operators out there, have any of these issues arisen, and how have they been dealt with? Such as what Kate was saying there of uh, support not being available for an old uh, piece of hardware that's yeah. now been uh, overtaken by someone else. But it's a very sort of interesting topic, indeed. What we see and both in sort of uh, in Scandinavia, but specifically in Norway and Denmark as well, is the first wave of consolidation is already going on. And it's it's specifically the smaller, maybe early entries of uh, CPOs, which didn't really sort of get attraction. They are now selling it off. But what we see is that it will bring sort of a better sort of customer experience out of it because it's the more established sort of uh, players who acquire these uh, charges and bring them to life. I personally had the experience of getting stuck on one of the smaller CPOs. At one point in time, my cable w- wouldn't release. I called the customer service. It was out of service hours and what to do. I was stuck there. Uh, so I fully reckon that this is a very bad experience. What I see is that as sort of 
consolation is coming, but also as the market matures, these are license to operate issues that you need to fix. You need to have 24 seven customer uh, support. You need to have an operational system which allows you sort of to go wherever you want to. But I also see that happening already as the second phase of uh, charging operators is entering the market. So it is a problem. And I would say that it is self-regulating in the sense that all the public charges out there, if you don't have first-line support, if you can't find out how to charge, if it's not visible in any of the apps out there, people will not use it. So it's a bad business and it will sort of, sort of that will be shown as in the good example of my colleague here in the panel that they will have bad ratings and people will not go there. So that's a very good way of incentivizing that people either get their f- things done or that they sort of will close down the business because there's no business at all. So the future is 24-7 customer success or customer support. It is that the chart is available and working as they're shown. All of this is is the new sort of the new future of e-mobility, of course. And I'm quite certain that that is also part of the consolidation. You won't see any successful consolidation if this is not working because then they will simply just consolidate a smaller entity and will not get money out of it. So they will have an incentive to fix it. But I also, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, I foresee you need regulation. You need some kind of sort of either on a state level or local level, mainly on a state level or in Europe and a European level, regulation on how, what to do. Because you will see on, like you did on Telco, that you will have a top tier four to six in each country of infrastructure owners. But underneath that or on top, you will have all the operators like you have on Telco. You have a multiple of service providers servicing the end user, like here, the EV driver, with uh, charging solutions on top of the infrastructure owner, like the CPOs. So you could actually have like four to six infrastructure owners owning this the charge point, but you will have a multiple, like 10 to 50 of uh, charging operators on top of that, servicing the end user. And there, the EV driver will choose the sort of the uh, charging provider with the best solution, with the better pricing, like you see on Telco. Uh, so I see it's it's two layered, but then you will have to have regulation on the ones who own the infrastructure because they will have to allow third parties to sort of access their infrastructure, like you see on Telco, on any other important infrastructure which is out there. So it was also a comment on what you said before. Lovely. So are you saying that it should be the infrastructure owners who become responsible for a lack of customer service support or that that smooth customer journey? Actually, we see that it's moving to the front end. So the charge point operator, which is sort of operating sort of the sort of the interface between the charger and the EV driver, they are the one having the first line support of the EV driver. And for them to have that successfully, of course, the backbone, which is the infrastructure owner, should have their call center for whatever is needed for the front end to solve any problems they can't fix. But that is already what has been going on in the more mature markets. You have the CPOs, which is somehow own the infrastructure, but they will have an operating interface, which will service either the EV driver directly or all of the third parties, which is on top, sort of laying on top as a service provider with their own offering on top of the infrastructure. But when it comes to in Sort of in the end, it is the in sort of the servicing of the EV driver 24-7, whatever is the problem out there which need to be serviced. And sort of the operational level of doing charging is now the important part. It's not just to put up a charger. It's not that it's available in an app. And it's actually that people can access it. And when you have trouble, you can get help 24-7. And that is the main unique sort of uh, points where people sort of, uh, are actually differentiated between what is a good service uh, charging provider and it's not, and this is the most this is the most important part of the EV charging at the moment. I think definitely with with that, what I'm now wondering is should it be made something that's more mandatory that any charge point operator should have a backup solution, whether it's um, a contract with the likes of the EAA or the RAC or Edley's Charge Ferry? Um, I'm sure there are other new businesses coming up with with other solutions for remotely being able to charge a vehicle at short notice. But where we've got these 
you know, dr- teams of drivers available across the country that should be um, delivering a roadside service to support anyone who's unable to get a charge from that particular unit. Should that then be something that all CPOs must be contracted into? I think it will come down to what is the need of the EV driver, because w- what we are servicing here is actually the availability of people of driving from point A to point B and charging along the way. So if there is a big need when the market matures for these kind of services, that should be either something which is out there in the market where people can sort of, they can buy it as a separate service or it should be mandatory for the one servicing the backbone of infrastructure in itself. So it will depend on, I'm very much in favor of it's this demand driven. So if it, this is a, thing which is needed to provide sort of either sort of the comfort of the EV driver or is this a necessity for for the charging solution? It should be. But I don't see that in any of the more mature markets, these specific things you you see here. It's more like a measurement of correcting a pain, which is right now. I don't see that pain specifically in the mature market at the moment, uh, to be honest. Kate, a quick question. sort of related to this, because I think we've had some great discussion so far, but my question to you would be, at what point do you think we're going to start seeing some major consolidation like that? Are we still at the stage where there's going to be more new CPOs before they start consolidating? Or are we at the stage where the big guys are starting to look at the smaller ones and go, that's where we need to be heading quickly? I think it's a blend of both, to be honest, Gary, because what I'm noticing is When I go networking and I'm attending events, there's a lot more people kind of realizing that there's still skin in the game, as it were, um, and they're they're making investments. They're trying to get into the electric vehicle industry because it seems like a financially viable um, and sound investment. So there are now people that are coming into the space and trying to create businesses because they can see the pound signs, um, as it were, and all of the people who have been here, who are the pioneers, you know, the um, the Toddingtons of the world, you've got Ian Johnson with, with Osprey, the ones that have come in because they're trying to do the right thing the right way from the very beginning. And they've invested so much money into this infrastructure on the blind belief that the EV revolution is going to happen. You know, they're the ones that, that are the good guys. And I think I'm hoping that they're the ones that are going to hold out. Um, and be able to acquire these smaller networks. However, I believe that there will be more networks registered between now and 2026. I think 2026 is going to be a major turning point. We're going to see, so back in 2020, when registrations for EVs really started to increase, um, a lot of them business fleets, you know, those cars are now falling onto the secondhand car market. So we're seeing a, a much more effective secondhand EV car market in 2023. The next round is going to be 2026. So I I honestly believe 2026 is going to be the year for consolidation, for kicking out people who have just tried to throw money at a situation today, um, who aren't delivering excellent service, reliable, accessible, safe infrastructure. Um, And that's, that's going to be the beginning of major consolidation. 2026, you heard it here first. Fantastic. Any uh, any final comments from anyone or can we uh, put a lid on this one and move on? I just want to say I've, I fully agree with uh, Kate that consolidation will come and you will have a major consolidation wave coming in at some point of time. But as you say, it is coming and it will also be a positive effect for the EV driver to uh, sort of increase the user experience of the EV driver because simply the smaller entities cannot facilitate all the new functionalities and integrations which is needed. So this it will be good when it, when it comes. But in the beginning, uh, larger and smaller is better. And later on, sort of uh, consolidation will be, be the thing to look for. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, thank you for that, Kate. Great topic. Tor, what do you want to talk about? I like to talk about uh, how do we bring charging to the masses uh, and sort of the arguments for my sort of little talk here is the, that sort of EV and EV driving for the sort of normal uh, person will not be successful or will not be of the same 
comfort as driving an old fossil fuel car until sort of we have uh, a large amount of uh, charging infrastructure out there. Uh, it is not a success until people sort of don't think about charging. Today, my parents still drive a fossil fuel car, but, and they don't worry about when they can sort of uh, get petrol or diesel on the car. Today, if you buy an uh, or lease an EV, you still have a little anxiety in the in the stomach on how can I actually uh, get charging and will I need get the charging when I need it? Is will I get the charging for the right price? And getting charging to the masses is the most important part of sort of getting sort of this transition into the into full speed. And when I say that, uh, there's many dilemmas in it. It is how do we make uh, charging easy and seamless in the user experience? Uh, how do we actually facilitate that? Does it need uh, any new players coming into the market? Does it need regulation to make sure that people take this serious when they actually address functionalities to a, to a EV driver? The other thing is, do we service uh, the different needs out there? Is there full attention on curbside uh, charging as public charging in general? Is uh, on DC hubs, on charging at company sites, uh, charging in your own garage? How do we integrate this whole user experience to make sure that the seamless experience comes to life? And then, of course, uh, one of the license to operate thing is uh, the money for funding all of this. Charging to the masses will take a lot of money. Who is going to invest in all of this? Uh, is there a business case today? Or do we need some kind of uh, more structured way of funding the charging for the masses in the future? So it brings a lot of things into the same melting pot of how we want to fix the problem of the future of uh, getting charging out there for all of us. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's a complicated issue. And I foresee that charging will come for the masses, but if we want to do it quicker rather than uh, too late, uh, we should think about this integrated solution as quickly as possible. So my question to Kate and you is, do you, where do you see sort of the need for, for regulation or the, or the state intervention in how we want to do this? What is the better way for them to, to help if, uh, as you see it? Amazing question. <laughs> so everything that has really occurred in the UK to date has been very much the ground up um, funded by private money um, and, and some incredibly brave business people. I would love to see public funding come into it much more than it is now. Um, you know, we've been promised large pots of money, free the infrastructure that haven't been paid out, um, where there's been no real uh, meaningful commitments and plans laid out on how it's going to be spent. It's very much pie in the sky figures. You know, you can have X amount of money for, for public charging and we'll make sure that everything's green and, and the the sky remains blue and everything's all lovely and clean air um, for the sake of political propaganda. And uh, I'm not I'm not into it. I want to see a pot of money being provided from the government, dished out equally uh, between local authorities, because there's a lot of local authorities currently missing out on funding because they don't have the right staff in their uh, in their local councils to make applications. Um, I think it's very much a, you know, those who shout the loudest um, uh, get the funding, or those who can invest in writing applications for funding, they're being rewarded the funding. I mean, we've seen some fantastic work come out of Oxfordshire. Um, they've really been the the front runners on EV infrastructure. But what I really want to see is bit more equality in the financing in terms of your street on street charging so curbside charging um, a really fantastic solution there are some really affordable models out there um, that just aren't being reviewed by the local authorities in a fair and consistent way I think some of the contracts are just being given to people they've previously worked for for ease of convenience and there's not a really in-depth understanding of just how much um, variety and, and and the different qualities that different uh, network providers can bring to this space. So I really feel like we now need to look at it from the top down, whereas up until now it's been from the ground up. 
So let's go into government, have these discussions. I know there's a lot of lobbying going on at the moment with the uh, REA, the Renewable Energy Association, uh, with the Electric Vehicle Association, and really just trying to have these conversations at that higher level. But then how do we filter down that exact, exact same consistency of communication into local authorities? And how do we ensure that every driver has a fair and consistent choice as to where they're going to charge? That's, that's my two pence, Gary. Well, it's interesting because I'm looking at data that came out from, um, forget what the exact source was, but there's, there's this whole perception that one of the reasons we're not getting good EV uptake is that the infrastructure is not there. And to, to a greater or lesser extent, I can kind of align with that. But the latest figures that come out indicate that uh, there is, because of the huge increase in installations over the last 12 months, there's now one charge point for every 11 electric cars or one charge point for every three electric cars where there is no home charging. Now, you couple that with the other statistic that ZapMap came out with the other day, which is that uh, on average, your charging infrastructure is only being used for about 16% of the time. But do we know how many of those charges actually work? Well, there are... Um, there's obviously questions in terms of the methodology to get that. I did chat with uh, Melanie to find out what it was. And she said, if if a charger has had a, somebody use it within the last 24 hours, it's deemed to have been working and therefore the capacity is worked out based on that. So mm-hmm. the I don't think it's as misleading or as, as um, inconclusive as we may think. I think there's some fairly stout data uh, underneath that. But, you know, I'm I'm trying to reconcile this whole thing of, the charging's not there, it's no good with, well, hang on, we're up to, you know, one charger for every three electric cars that's only being used, uh, of this, that's basically spending 86% of its time not being used. And h- how do we reconcile those two issues? I think one should take into account, one thing is to measure how many pieces of hardware is out there for a car. What Kate says is super important. Does they do their work? And is there a car there parked like... <laughs> All day, just charging uh, half an hour, and then it sort of is uh, blocking the charging for the rest of the day. So the mm-hmm. regulation on sort of making sure when you have public charging that there's some kind of regulation that or incentive that you, whenever you are done charging, you can sort of uh, liberate the charger and get the charger available for another one. So I, I think the number eleven or three per per. Uh, Per car is is a viable numbers, but it's also how you use those and how you are they operational? Are the pricing right? Are the uh, availability there? Even though the charger is there, all of this should be worked on, and that is for the local community in many cases to make sure. First of all, to make sure the parking at these public parking sites is limited in some kind of way that you have to charge whenever you're there, and you cannot park for twenty hours afterwards on the on at that location if uh, you don't charge. The other thing is when you do public money for public charge points, whenever it's a private uh, entity putting it up, there should be regulation on what is your pricing. Can you just take whatever pricing you want uh, or is there regulation on the pricing you take? Is there a regulation on do you accept third-party roaming or not? Is it only your own card or your own app which is usable there? All of this should be as flexible and as broadly uh, supporting the user experience as, as, as you can. Because of what we see in the mature market is in the beginning, people got money out of this sort of the, the local or the national entities or state for supporting the infrastructure, but they forgot to put requirements on it. So forgot to say that, okay, when you get a funded infrastructure, which is needed, I fully agree. Then there's also requirements on how is the prices you can take? What is how are they regulated? How are the requirements for allowing other operators to sort of use your infrastructure, which has got public money, to allow as much volume as much uh, EV drivers, as many EV drivers as possible going there? So, to I think the number of charges is is a good number, but all of the things around it, supporting it by local regulation or national regulation, is the thing which can optimize sort of the uses uh, of that specific charger, but also the user experience coming out of it. I think one thing that 
I often hear, uh, specifically in the UK, but I assume there's a similar figure for everyone else. We need, whatever the figure is, 600,000 new public charges to be able to support the move to uh, banning the sale of uh, fossil fuel vehicles in 2030. But what nobody actually has the data for is how are we splitting up that 600,000 and where are those 600,000 going to go? And I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, around that figure to get people comfortable with the fact that, yes, we may need 600,000, but is it going to be 500,000 destination charges and 100,000 uh, rapid and ultra rapid charges, or is it going to be 300,000 of each? I mean, I, I'm on record on this podcast as saying that destination charging, you know, AC charging is the secret source to EV adoption. If you can get the right number of seven or 11 kilowatt chargers in place in the right um locations, the need to have a large number of rapid or ultra rapid charges reduces. What do we think about that? I think you're absolutely right. We had um, an office facility in Portsmouth whereby they had six, uh, seven kilowatt uh, charging bays and they were packed every day. It was difficult to um, get a, sp- a space to charge the car. Um, and they were limited to four hours use. And the security guard would rock around at about one o'clock in the afternoon, take a note of all the reg plates and, and notify uh, the receptionist if anybody had overstayed uh, their four-hour block. And they were extremely popular. And this is an office that has thousands of employees going into it every day from a, a collection of local businesses. So why not make the entire car park um, have an EV charger on it? And then when everybody gets to work, they can charge whilst they're at work and the car is stationary. And therefore, they won't be blocking the on-street chargers when they get home. And people who may not have the facility to charge when they're at work are more likely to be able to use the on-street chargers so that they can charge whilst they sleep. Um, Yeah, I I think there's an absolute use case for upping the destination charger numbers and slimming down the rapids, but the rapids are still very important. For the likes of our team, for example, um, they're out on the road driving all over the UK. When they need to stop and charge, they really only have an hour to do that because we're running a business and we can't afford to be sat there for four hours at a time. You know? Yeah, I agree with you, Kate. Your destination charging will be the backbone, and then you'll have the additional services from the uh, superchargers and the hubs when you sort of need a little fill up or you sort of didn't get the time to charge during night time. So they are sort of, uh, they are interrelated for sure. But I don't know, uh, just to comment on what you said before, it might be what you said, but just to stress that all the the company charge points out there, which is available for their own employees, which is super important for people going to work on an EV, uh, they will also be part of the in, uh, infrastructure uh, network in the sense that outside the opening hours of the office, they, with the functionalities in the uh, sort of the platforms which is available in the market, the company can open those for the public in non-office hours and making them into an infrastructure which supports sort of the public charging networks in the local community. So the company can allow the uh, charges to be open to public during uh, hours like from five in the evening until eight in the morning with the price they want to charge for that. And then in office hours, they are a closed universe only allowed for the employees. And that is easily sort of uh, operational by the platforms available like the Spiri one, but there's others as well. So in that sense, you multiply the charges, which will sort of uh, carry the load of uh, the charging needs for the future. So all of these fleet charging or employee charging charges out there is part of the uh, solution for the future and part of the uh, destination charging, which can be used for servicing the market. And one shouldn't sort of forget that. Thank you, Tor. I do wholly actually believe as well that um, for the use of like commercial vehicles, they will need their own separate charging facility. And that's not to um, exclude them from being normal vehicles requiring a charge. I just think that they have extra needs that cannot currently be fulfilled by the usual public infrastructure setup. So I'm 
I'm really looking forward to and hope to see lots of fleet charging depot style solutions for like commercial vehicles and then the HGVs as they start to uh, come into circulation. Yeah, and the the uh, sort of the solution is ready, deployable already. So it, it's more like to get this knowledge out there that you can actually make a business case out of your charger, even though you think it's only for your own use. You can, like an Airbnb charger, like you did on apartments, you can make that available and earn money from it and supporting the community while doing it. So that is available. And then, of course, the whole build out of uh, superchargers or charging hubs. Uh, that is also a big wave coming now that you will have destination charging, but also the sort of the accessibility of getting to a charger, which will allow you to charge, just uh, fill up your battery for 15, 20 minutes and then go on. This is also a very hot thing in infrastructure funds. They gladly support this. Uh, if they are in the right location, uh, then these are very sort of uh, interesting sort of uh, investment objects for infrastructure funds at the moment because a lot of volume will come be carried through those uh, superchargers in the future. Right, cool. Are we uh, comfortable with that subject? Do we want to move on? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So, Warren, you're going to be talking about FUD and FUD busting, I believe. So take it away. Oh, thanks, Harry. Um, so, as you know, we're a small organization. Um, we have a very tight budget. We run um, on a shoestring, um, and we fight at quite a high level. We're talking to parliamentarians doing various bits and pieces. But one of the questions I've been asked, and I wanted to put it to the panel, was uh, FUD, FUD fighting. Should an organization like mine be devoting time to fighting FUD, or should we be doing what we're doing now, which is devoting our time to doing the things that we feel are most, most important, talking to parliamentarians, fighting on behalf of our our um, members um, and I often get criticised so I don't weigh in on Twitter and Facebook on on these topics and I know that uh, Kate and Gary you guys do, you're, you're out there fighting so uh, so that was my question to you guys, should I one, spend more time in it and two, should I find a way to fund it so that we have a dedicated resource that we use at EVA England to fight FUD Kate? Yeah, I feel like the work that you do at the EVA is insanely valuable for future generations of electric vehicle drivers. So you're really influencing change at the highest possible level. And that's exactly where we need you. Because if if we don't create these policies and processes and affect this change today, then we're further delaying mass adoption of electric vehicles, right? So I think I, I, I would like to believe that everybody here would agree that you are extremely valuable and need to continue doing what you're doing. What I would say, however, is the social media channels could probably be utilised to better promote um, when misinformation has been printed. So much like when you, if you were to post and say, oh, the EVA has done this amazing thing and this is what's you know coming up for everybody, um, it could be that you have a quite fun segment, but that is a collection of everybody else in the industry who's already done the the fud slinging um, on your behalf. So um, the likes of you know, as you mentioned, myself and Gary, uh, Dr. Ewan McTurk, Graham Cooper, Quentin Wilson, uh, Jill Now. There's so many amazing people in the industry who regularly post content on their Twitter feeds, LinkedIn feeds, where they highlight something that's gone out that is blatantly misleading um, and and then, you know, explained why it's wrong. Um, even just using your platforms as a way of sharing it um, and maybe dedicating a small amount of time by an office administrator to just fact check. Um, though those people will already have done their due diligence and fact checked it enough. Um, maybe having a bank of uh, trusted <laughs> informants that you can feel comfortable um, in sharing their content. But absolutely, do not s- spend your precious time fud busting when we've already got a bank of incredible people who are doing it on the daily. But sharing, I, I think maybe you could find time for that. Tor, is, um, is this sort of anti EV rhetoric something that's uh, apparent in Scandinavia, in Norway, in places like that, or, or has that? Uh, have you gone 
beyond that? I think that we can be beyond it, but I think it's very sort of it's a thing which one has to put full attention to. So I think it's something which you need to address and you should put your efforts into. I fully find that in general, what Kate is saying that sort of the EVO associations on sort of bringing sort of a combined joint view from the driver's side to regulation, but also towards industry strengths to all of this, it's it's a, it's something that you need to have. It's something that you need. And the stronger this, these organizations are, stronger they can build themselves and position themselves towards sort of how is the market going to be built in the future, not only in sort of the issues of problems right now, but how we want to facilitate EV driving in the future. That is super important to have that place. So it's not only the industry driving it, it, it could be a money thing then only, and that is not how we want to do it. So, but the thing is to, to facilitate that, you need to have sometimes uh, what is the position you want to take, what is the angle you want to sort of address. And all of this is difficult the larger you grow, but it's not less important. Uh, so I think I support what, what Kate says, said in the sort of in these views, but I also find that what you're doing is a super important this point of state the the market is. Warren, um one of the things I'd like to see from the EVA uh and any of the EVAs, not just England, but uh, all the other ones that are around there, is a central point that, because it, because let me see if I can formulate my thoughts on the fly here. As Kate said, there are lots of different people who have lots of different pieces of knowledge and information. I mean, if anybody comes to me and says, oh, batteries can't do this, the first thing I'm going to do is say, Dr. Ewan McTurk, tell me whether this is true or false. And Ewan will always come up with the right answer for that. But what I would like to see is a central place where somebody can go and find all that information. Now, I don't mean the EVA England should be the place to create that, but if there's a central page or some there, something anywhere where you can go in and say, this has come up as FUD, click here and we'll take you to a reliable source that will tell you whether that's true or false. So maybe um, a repository of links to, to other FUD busting uh, individuals. What do we think about that? Yeah, definitely. Like, so that's a conversation I've actually had with Kate before, um, and some other people around. Um, and those resources do exist. The problem we have is how do you find, it's a trust. People just don't trust, you know, certain, certain people in the thing. So we just kind of need to find how we make this available to everybody. It is on my list of things I would like to do. Um, I tweeted the other day, I think Robert Llewellyn tweeted something about, you know, a well-funded or a modestly funded organization that could be like anti-FUD. Um, and I think I replied to his tweet with something like, if 20% or something like 10% of the people, maybe 5% of people who have read this tweet joined EVA England, I could fully fund someone to do that, that job easily. It wouldn't even be an easy, it wouldn't even be a difficult decision for me to make. Um, uh, and, and weirdly, the backlash I got on it was just really strange. I thought I, I thought people would really support it, but I got quite a lot of backlash from people saying, "You know, why should why should someone be paid to do this when it's something that we all do?" And it's like I know we all do this; it is something we all do. But the, the fossil fuel lobby and the people lobbying and the people putting these stories into the press are super funded. I wouldn't say organised, but I would definitely say funded. They have money; they have the ability to go and throw tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds at these these things, these stories that we're starting to see in the papers. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting to see how people were, people reacted to my tweet. It was kind of why I wanted to bring up the conversation here. But thank you all for your, for your comments. But uh, War just Warren, just a question. What is the sort of most common things that you sort of come across at the moment? Oh, oh we see them all. And I'm sure that, I mean, to be honest, Gary and, Gary and Kate are probably better position to answer that question because I try not to look because I'm so busy with other things that it's like getting sucked into a rebel. What I do tend to do a lot of actually is point other people at it who I know will fight the fight because uh, my blood pressure can't take me on Twitter and Facebook that much. <laughs> so uh, so I tend to sit back and just let, let the likes of Gary and Kate and Ewan McTurk go in there with uh, with uh, decent bullets and, and uh, take them out. And this is the thing, Warren makes a really good point about having someone dedicated full time to this as an issue. I think, um, you know, we're, we're all aware of one fantastic PR guy in the industry, Ben Kilby. He 
dedicates his whole day, every day, to fighting FUD and pushing um, good news stories in the direction of media. He's got the contacts. He knows how to word things. He knows how to create a really nice um, hype around certain articles. So if you had a Ben on your team, Warren, it, you would be able to push out so much positive news, which would be fantastic. And I really don't see that as a bad thing for the EVA to fund. But like you say, it's finding that resource. Um, if you had 10% of Robert's, uh, Robert Llewellyn's following sign up as an EVA member, why shouldn't you be able to, to use that money to push positive PR? Um, exactly. If, yeah. If, 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 I, if, I had, if I had the members for it, I would do it. The, we're, we're funded by members, but, but only in a minor way. Most of our funding comes from grants we get to do very specific pieces of work, which is what we work on, which is why we don't do the press and the, and the, the, the sort of, um, outreach stuff that we really should be doing because we just don't have time. You know, it's not fun. It's not what's giving us money at the moment. If we got to the point where we had, you know, tens of thousands of members, it would be a no brainer. I could do this stuff. It, you know, it, it would just be a simple decision to make, right, this will fund, this is self-sustaining, we can do this stuff, we can do it. And I'm guessing it would be uh, slightly unethical to accept um, donations from businesses on behalf of hiring this person for fear of potential conflict of interest? That's my thing, right? So I won't take money from anybody. The money comes either through very specific grants that we apply for to do specific pieces of work or it comes directly from membership. And we're looking to do some deals maybe with some some companies to try and do some sort of um you know they they can they can in essence buy membership at a discount rate for their driver so a leasing company for instance might be able to buy a discount membership for you know their their hundred thousand drivers it's it's those kind of things we would be willing to do but then it again it'd be the individual members that would be the members not the actual company behind it um but ethically and morally it puts me in a better standing when I'm talking in Parliament to be saying we're independent, we represent drivers, we don't represent big companies. We are we're not taking money from people in that way. We we the independence piece is very important and the voluntary piece is very very important for me. I I, I personally all the work I do for EVA England, for EV drivers and for renewables and sustainability is all for my own back. I have a day job that I just left to jump onto this podcast. But I, I have a day job that means I can do this and I can get support in Parliament and support uh, in government where other people can't because they are taking, they're, they're vested, they're in, they have interests in the industry that I don't have. And I think the answer to the question that Tor answered as to which is the most common piece of FUD is, well, it depends on what day of the week you're talking about because sometimes it's the the kids uh, digging up the cobalt in the uh, Congo. Sometimes it's the weight of the vehicles. Sometimes it's this discredited uh, Volvo account that it takes uh, 70,000 miles to repay the carbon debt from a, an electric vehicle. And it just depends on what the agenda is that the specific individual is trying to push forward as to which amount of FUD or what, what particular piece of FUD they, uh, they like to use. So it does depend. I think as well, like over um, <laughs> the COVID and lockdowns and everything, everybody is so much more savvy to the sources of in of information now, and we all follow the money trail to find out exactly where it's come from and if it is a paid for piece or, or if it's been written by a journalist who has certain undeclared interests. So that independence is super important and not something that should be compromised. Warren, anything else to say? No, I think I think that's me covered. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. You're more than welcome. My turn. Now, my topic is, well, an interest, well I think it's an interesting one, uh, roaming. Now, it seems like every other week we get one of the following things occurring when it comes to paying for charging. We either get a new service or a new app starting that allows you to pay for charging on different charge point operators, or we get a new charge point operator that has been added to existing charging solutions. And there's a large amount of overlap here, but it does raise two main points that need to be addressed. Firstly, why is it always similar charge point operators that link into all the roaming networks? And secondly, why are there some charge point operators that steadfastly refuse to link into roaming services? Instavolt are one, and I think Grid Server are another, that tend to be very selective about who they partner with, and they're not on any of the, the big um, uh, services like ZapMap and Electroverse and, and things like that. Now, if you think about it, every CPO in the UK should have 
by, uh, by law contactless access to pay for their charging. But you can't use contactless at a Tesla unit and you can't use contactless at an Ionity unit. Both of these are app only for all EVs. Although, of course, for Teslas, it, if you're on the supercharger network, it's actually plug and charge. Other networks such as Podpoint work mostly on the plug in and go, but claim you're charged within 15 minutes on the app solution, which is both a bit of a pain in the neck and it's open to abuse. I know of quite a few taxi drivers who use the 15 minutes free charge, unplug and charge back in to get another free 15 minutes while they're waiting. And of course, the new standards for charging infrastructure only mandate contactless on units that are more powerful than seven kilowatt charging, which cuts out most of the destination charges in the country. Now, I was in, in much the same way as Warren. I was in Paris over the weekend and I was able in Europe to use a single roaming solution for all my charging over there because the roaming situation is more open and accepted there. No messing around with apps or contactless, just flash my RFID card and go work to every unit I tried across several different operators. So my question to the panel is this, why don't all roaming apps have access to all charge point operators? And Tor, because of your background and your situation, can you start with this one for me, please? I fully sort of follow your track on every charge that should be available for roaming, first of all. And I see that the majority of charges, mainly on mainland Europe, is following that sort of uh, track. And the reason they do it is that actually now that just attracts more volume to their charge and thereby more volume to their uh, investment. I do see that some charge point operators or some infrastructure owners haven't seen that sort of the, the light in, in doing that. So they still believe that a way to sort of getting their business case to stick together is just to allow their own universe, to allow only customers for using their own charge card or their own app. Uh, but that is only viable for either a, a charge point operator who has market control. So they actually have like 30, 40, 50% of, of charges there because then they can sort of sort of stick their business case together by only allowing this membership club of doing it. Uh, but I fully, as I said in the earlier topic, if you have a public charger and you have been allowed to put up a charger in the public, there should be regulations stating you should open that charger to the public in the sense that there should uh, be roaming available. And then about the contactless uh, sort of charging, uh, you can have contactless charging by a credit card or by an app. In, in principle, they are both uh, contactless uh, charging. Right? The app, you only have sort of the charge, your credit card in the app. Uh, I fully support it. Then there is difficulties and that is actually a bit on the technical side. It's a bit problematic for some of the smaller CPOs to actually to do roaming because you need people to, to do it either for you or uh, internally or outsource. So it takes money to do it, but it's the future. So people who still believe that they can have a business case with like one or even a thousand charges, which is not on roaming, they are not going to survive. So you need to open up both for their own sake, but also for the EV driver who will, like you said, doing in Paris, you you don't want to use 10 different apps or 10 different charge cards or whatever uh, in going around in the city or uh, on your holiday. You only need one. That is the future. Warren? Uh, so a couple of years ago when we first founded, we we did a survey of EV drivers and got some massive responses. And we use that to push into the um, consumer experience work that they were doing. And it's a big piece of work we've been doing and working on for nearly three years now, I think it is. Um, and it came up with some interesting things. Driver, but drivers got the ability to use one app or RFID, RFID card across all charge points, regardless of charge point networks, so that's roaming. Uh, they wanted to do them in the easiest possible way. Um, and some quick figures, 87% of drivers would embrace it to use one smartphone app across all public charge point networks. 71% would welcome the ability to use one RFID card and 41% would like the ability to use a QR code at public transport. Now, um, we've done tons of work on this and, and you know, it, it's huge. Um, the, the, the conversations we have with government is that they don't really want to mandate roaming because it's pushing their agenda onto, um, onto the CPOs. But as far as I can see, we should be pushing for this. We should make, it should, it should be something that we do. Um, and another quick point there, and it, 
so as of well when it goes live which i'm hoping will be very soon um it will be mandated that everything above eight kilowatts will be um contactless so there'll be a contactless reader on every every charger above eight kilowatts now i know you mentioned why why not under seven kilowatts and there's a few reasons for it you know we speak to people in the industry uh the cost of it is one um the, the cost of it is one where you uh, the, the the cost of having one of those those contact points on every single charger can be prohibitive if you've got lots and lots of seven kilowatt chargers um the other thing to note, actually, is is that if you do, if you mandate onto the charging, you kind of take away some of the other cool things you can do with chargers. So if you um, if you say take a company that has a, a, a contract to put in ten thousand chargers across a um, across say Surrey or Sussex, right? They're going to put in ten thousand chargers across Sussex. Um, that's a lot of charging. Now, if they could. Do, they're there yeah. something where they could just build a system where everyone who signed up their charging could get cheaper charging if they could do delay charging. They could do a lot of the sort of network aggregation pieces where you don't want everyone charging at seven o'clock. Someone comes home from what they come to the car at five. You don't want to start the charge at five, really. You want to start the charge at midnight when it's cheaper. If you if you have an app that can do that as part of your plugin, you could offer cheaper charging if they decide to charge at a later a later time. That's much better for the grid and it's much cheaper for the end user. If they just need to use to make sure their tire is charged for the morning and you can let the charger and the, 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 in this case, the CPO take care of that, you can get real savings for the end user. So mandating that they have to have a, a contactless charger on them kind of screws that because they click on, someone just comes on, clicks on and starts charging immediately because they're not part of this, this arbitrary system. So there, there are, there are, reasons for it and there are reasons against um personally i think roaming is a great idea for the majority of people the ability to have um you know be able to just, just click on and, and do this stuff easily and quickly is really really handy but i think that having a contactless reader on faster charges takes a lot of that that convenience or, or gives you a lot of that convenience so it takes a lot of reasoning for roaming away um Except, of course, if you're in a different country like France, it's really, really handy. You could just use your one app to kind of just do all your charging with and all your receipts are in one place as well. But anyway, that's my my bit. But there's a small question uh, to Warren. When you say contactless, yeah, uh, what is do you mean only by credit card or also also contactless yes. via the app? Uh, so in the UK, a contactless charger is, I believe, a credit card. Yeah. So you have to be able to have a credit card reader. Okay, because when you use when you go into the store, don't you use your app? Or your phone as the contactless uh, integration. You don't use the card anymore. Dude. In many cases. Yeah, but that still that still reads as a standard reader. So yeah, yeah. so like like I don't want to be opening up like my X app. So you like I, I was I was like I, uh, there's lots of them. I go to Ionity. I have to use Ionity app yeah. to use Ionity, right? Mm. But I've got you know there's there are cards that will work with it. Mm. But I, I really just want to be able to go up there with my credit card or my Apple Pay or my Google Pay and just go click and away we go, right? That's really what I want to do. Um, of course, giving um, your customers an advantage or a discount because they're a customer or something I completely understand that encourages people to download your app and do your bits or go on to roaming. But the idea for me is literally if you just run up, walk up to your to charge it, you plug your car in and you tap the, the thing and it will pay, that's kind of all I want. I do like the Fastnet idea. I, I just set up for that as well. It's auto charge and the same as Tesla. You, you plug it, it reads the MAC address on the CCS and it knows you are because you've got an account and that charges automatically. That I think will be a big, a big one when people realize how cool that is and how easy that is. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's just if I want a credit card reader, right? Whether it's Apple Pay, Google Pay or a normal credit card, I just want a credit card reader just as a default baseline. That's where I want to be. Now, Kate, I think you're going to come in and play devil's advocate on this one, aren't you? <laughs> oh, how the turntables. I am <laughs> going to play devil's advocate. I don't like roaming. Um, as an EV driver, and I'm strictly putting my charge safe hat down for a second. As someone who started driving an electric vehicle in September, September 2020, so still just under three years and I'm, I'm pretty sure I could bet that I'm the youngest EV driver in terms 
of years served in an EV. Uh, I don't, I didn't even know what RFID meant when I first jumped in the car and, and hopped along my merry journey, which resulted in ugly crying at a charge point on the motorway. I didn't understand what RFID meant. And I still can't even really tell you. I feel like it's radio frequency identification data or something. I don't know. So anyway, something like that. Yeah. If, it, if that's just me, right, this is going to be a, a mass thing because there are many, many people out there who are not as technically excellent as the people on this panel who are used to paying for their fuel with their card, who are used to the simplicity of rocking up, pumping or plugging in, uh, paying with their card, grabbing a receipt where they can and leaving. And I feel like roaming overcomplicates that to the point that we now have several different roaming solutions, several different cards with contracts with several different operators, (laughs) and it's already becoming too complicated. So Whilst I appreciate and I definitely can endorse the benefits of a roaming solution for fleet operation, so anybody who has a business fleet and require invoices, receipts, etc., details of, of journeys taken, absolutely roaming is the solution. But when we're looking at getting EVs to the masses, absolutely not. I need a contactless uh, debit or credit card solution. As Warren says, I'd love to be able to use my Apple Pay. I don't really like taking my cards out in public anymore and certainly not late at night in a in a car park when I'm on my own. If I could have less assets on me, um, as little assets on me as possible when I have to get out of my vehicle and plug in and charge even better, which is why I, I love that Fastnet have the uh, a similar system to Tesla. But let's be real, um, when we go and charge our car, the quickest, simplest solution is to just tap and, and you're done. The other element that we've not really touched upon is competition. So there are operators out there that charge a pound for a pre-authorization, which I love. And then there are operators out there who reckon you've got £45 spare in your bank account. And if you don't have £45 spare for the pre-auth, you, w- you won't get to charge. So for me, the people who charge the pound or the lesser amount will probably get my favour when it comes to picking um, where I'm going to charge over the £45 pre-authorization, which is frankly ridiculous, another topic altogether and something I would love to see a solution and regulation brought in for. Um, but without competition, the, there's no there's no difference in the service that we receive and, and there aren't biz- there won't be businesses out there who can offer a better solution for its customers because then it's too uh blanket over over the whole thing so that's another thing the technical challenges as i mentioned earlier i didn't even know what rfid stood for i didn't know what it meant i had to google it um a lot of other people will not be um that technical and and it's just not inclusive language to be using on a charge point. Um, I beg, please go out, find five people on the street today and ask them if they know what an RFID card is and what it stands for and what its use purpose is. And they will probably shake their head um, and say, I've got, I've got absolutely no idea. So domestic use is kind of like <laughs> the whole hydro thing. For for domestic, not not really um a solution, but in large business cases, yeah, I, I can see how that works. I think there's a couple of things I want to sort of throw out here. Um, when I'm talking about roaming, I'm not necessarily talking about RFID cards. Okay. I'm talking about a non-contactless solution that could be used anywhere. Now, one of the bugbears of mine is that there are so many different roaming solutions and some of them uh, access these particular CPOs and some of them access those ones. Some of them are app-based, some of them are card-based. I don't care whether it's an app or a card, and I don't care how many they are. My, my contention is that regardless of which one it is, I should be able to pick either an app or an RFID card, and I should be able to use that on every charge point operator. Because at the end of the day, it's no different to using uh, Apple Pay or Google Pay, or a contactless card. It's one 
way of paying at all charge point operators. So yeah, I can understand that there's an issue with well, what exactly is an RFID and what does it mean? But if if you position it as a case of saying you currently have, you know, a Lloyds Bank debit or credit card and you can pay with that, or we give you an extra card which looks the same, works the same, and that could be used in a similar way. But with using a roaming card, you can then take advantage of some of the things that Warren was talking about with uh time of day charging, changing the tariffs, you know, all, all the good stuff, the uh, the invoicing if it's a fleet operation. So I I don't want people to get confused with the fact that I'm I'm thinking there should only be one RFID card and everybody should have it and it should work everywhere. No, there should only be what well, you could pick whichever roaming solution you want, but it should work everywhere. Does that make with sense? That, from a, that, thank you for clarifying that, Gary. With that, then are we a commercial challenge in that um, these these roaming solutions are we build at the point of the charge, or is that then build as a monthly invoice type scenario? And if it is the latter, could that then put the provider at risk of having to chase for a ton of debt when those payments don't succeed? And if it is the former, do we have to load these cards in order to pay for what we predict will be our, our monthly usage? Well, I think the answer to that depends on what solution you're looking for. There are some roaming solutions at the moment where you put a payment card into the solution and uh, the supplier or the provider gets paid instantaneously. There are some where you have to preload money into the solution. And once that's done, you have to preload more, otherwise you can't charge. And there are some where it gets put onto a monthly bill and gets sent out uh, to be paid for at the end of the month. So that's what I mean about you can choose which solution you want, but whichever solution you want has to work everywhere. I think all of the solutions we're talking about now is available across markets at the moment. I fully agree that there's different ways of sort of describing what is roaming. For me, it's sort of the availability for people to access a charger, no matter how they want to access it. And sort of the apps out there is sort of at the moment the only way where you can actually see what the price is. So you get the information on the price while you're charging. You can decide on charge on, on what kind of uh, payment methods you want to use. Apple Pay, Google Pay, your credit card or your other credit card or your uh, company credit card if that's if you're driving in the company. All of this put it in. So if you want your your physical card, RFID card to put into the app, it's there. So you don't need to take out any cards while you're at the charging point, only push a button. But you know the price before you're charging. You can reserve when you want to charge. You can sort of uh, do it. You only start on, do not start until nine in the evening. All of this is availability via one app and you can choose among a variety of apps. And that's for me roaming. That is roaming that you can access all of these functionalities all of the monitoring and what you pay and how you pay. And that is much better via an app, in my point of view, than just a credit card where you have no information at all uh, beforehand. Uh, but that is for me contentless, and that is for me roaming, and that is for me a necessity for the future for the EV driver to have the best experience and the full uh, functionalities which will come and is already there. All of these are already there across markets. Uh, so I fully... I'm a full ambassador of getting these ones out there to the knowledge of the market because they are available. Any final comments on this? Yeah, I just want to say, Gary, one last thing. You were talking about why aren't all networks opened up to all roaming providers? Um, it's a lot of work to open yourself up to a roaming provider. You have to do the integration piece in the background, and that does take a lot to do. Um, and if you look at networks, um, if we say something like GridServe, um, they have a lot of different hardware um, across their network where you've got very particular hardware that they installed obviously at their um, at their hubs and then you've got other hardware that's on their service stations and you've got all the bits and pieces and that integration piece behind the scenes is huge um, and then you've got adding to that having someone else be able to click in and do something with it or having multiple partners be able to do that as well so it, it, for someone like me if I'm, if I'm lobbying um, the pushback is going to be very big from the CPOs because they're going to say well if you make this a legal requirement that roaming is available and we, we have we have to accept roaming from any roaming provider, that's a huge amount of back end work for them 
or they're going to say it's a huge amount of back then for them anyway. I think my last thoughts on this is potentially this could be something that is consolidated with the network consolidation in, in the next five to 10 years, because clearly there are excellent arguments for and against roaming, but it's still something that presents huge amounts of technical challenges as Warren has just, um, you know, pressed on and not all CPOs are up for it. So I feel like this is, this is not over. Totally agree. I want 99% reliability first. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> you, you won't hear anybody uh, arguing against that one, Warren, at all. Um, many thanks, Kate, Tor, and Warren, for the topics and the discussion today. Um, it's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with the, the listeners. Does anybody else on the call have a cool thing that they'd like to share? So, uh, very recently, I went camping and I would really love to see in future uh, camp mode and dog mode in all vehicles, not just Teslas, because I was extremely jealous when uh, industry colleague Sarah Sloman rocked up and camped in her very comfortable uh, Tesla for the weekend when I was stuck on the cold hard ground in my eight-man TP. And that's it. Well, it, it's I, I can't understand how it is that despite the fact that Tesla have had this functionality for quite a few years, no other char- um, OEM has decided that they're going to put any sort of similar functionality in it. You, you, my Kia has that. My Inira has, has, has utility mode. If you're in the car, yeah, we can put it into utility mode. Yeah. I've done it before with camping. We use it to run cooler. We just put oh, it into yeah. utility mode, whacked the cooler in, plugged it into the 12 volt, let it run the, let it run the fridge all weekend. But could you, could you sleep in it comfortably? Could you leave the dog in your car? Yeah. Uh, look, look, I'm a big guy. I'm not sure comfortably in this. <laughs> yeah, you could sit in all night. You could be in all night. If you wanted to just back, put the seats back. That's amazing. I like that. Yeah, I think I think it's a, it's a standard function on the Kia on the Kia software. So I think if you have a Kia or a Hyundai vehicle of any of their sister companies, there is an option to go into what's called utility mode. It basically disengages the drivetrain, so you can sit in the car and leave. You know, and the car will just run off traction battery, run everything internally. So, air conditioning, heating, just turn the lights off because you don't want to leave the lights on. It's what I used actually when I went to the fully charged outside cinema piece. And whenever we go to the cinema, it's what I use. So, the car isn't actually, I can't actually accidentally slam onto the accelerator and fly into the car in front of me because the car won't move. Nice. So, I think Kia then becomes the exception that proves the rule for everybody else there, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> My cool thing is a website called Go Trip. It's a charger, finder, and range planner, which is what our podcast sponsors, ZapMap, do and do much better. But it has one nifty feature which will be really useful for persuading hesitant people into an electric vehicle. It has a function where you tell it what car you're driving, and it will then show you the actual distance that car can drive from a given point in a display called a spider chart. It's not a, a pure circle like a lot of range calculators. It takes into account road type, speed limits, and elevation change. And now I tried it with my ID3, and it's pretty accurate. If your car doesn't quite match the specs, uh, you can enter your own range calculations, and it will rework the spider graph to show the revised distances. It also has options for winter and summer driving and round-trip calculations, i.e. how far can you drive and still make it home on a single charge. I quite like that. Uh, Warren, anything as a cool thing from you? So my cool thing... Well, uh, Kate, Gary and myself were on an EV rally this weekend, going from uh, London to Brighton and then on to Paris. Um, but I'm going to talk about a different rally, something called the Leah Marnie Cup, which is on the 13th of August, 2023. Um, it's an event that was originally held in 1914. So it's the 109th anniversary of this event. And it's a fuel efficiency rally. And it's uh, the you score by ton as well. So it doesn't, it sort of levels the field a bit with heavy cars against lighter cars. Um, it, this year, it's an efficiency rally running from Tilbury Fort to Leah Marley Tarry in Essex. Uh, there's a bunch of classes for cars pre-1925 and then a whole bunch of split classes. They have a post-2015 class. They have a hybrid class. And then since 2021, they've been doing a full EV class. Now, I, I ran it in 2021 when they first did the EV class. It was run by some friends of mine, Andrew and Adele, in their Tesla Model 3 long range. 
Uh, last year, it was won by the legend that is Kevin Booker in the Mustang mach And so this is the third year of the EV class running and uh, I should be going along to have a go. And I highly recommend it. It's lovely. It's a day with lots of people who are car enthusiasts enjoying their day. It's a jaunt around the countryside very gently. There's a picnic lunch at Stately Home and then you finish at Leomani for a spot of tea. Um, generally or genuinely a lovely, lovely day. So uh, that's my cool thing. And maybe some of your listeners and maybe you, Gary, come along and enjoy the day with us. Thanks again to Kate, Warren and Tor for their time. Let me know either on social media or email what you thought of the discussion. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapman, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps EV drivers search, plan and pay for their charging. Zapmap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using Zapmap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, You've Gone Renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musing TV with the words Excalibur. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he's always keen to find some sort of electric unicycle or one wheel with a little bit more power, a little bit more speed. Really likes to burn fossil fuel cars off at the lights. But he's also conscious of the fact that he can't make them all look bad or they'll just rebel against EVs. So he's constantly asking himself the question, how do we ensure that these these drivers aren't being left behind and that some brands aren't giving the entire industry a really bad name? Thanks for listening to the show and the season. See you in about six weeks time. Bye-bye.